Welcome to another edition of Spotlight on Mayapac Schools. Eric Gross, your host, along with Superintendent of Schools, Anthony DiCarlo. And Anthony, beautiful fall weather for a change. Yeah, I mean, listen, the last two weeks have been beautiful. It's been in the 60s, it occasionally gets in the 70s, and it's been great. We've got to be able to get our kids to go outside, classes and a variety of them, and, you know, having outdoor instruction, which is always great, gives them a break from the masks. Um, you know, our activities, some of which are putting, we take place outside, our sporting events. We've had some great nights. We had Heroes Night. Mm -hmm. As you remember, a couple of weeks ago, we have Homecoming, mm -hmm. which will be next Friday night. And then the Friday night after that, we have our senior night. So there's a lot of great things that are going on. Next week, there'll be homecoming activities at the high school. There'll be long theme days, games, events. You know, so it's, it's exciting. Uh, and I think the kids are excited about really getting back to some of the traditional things that would take place all the time. And they're excited to be back. You know, we have our mitigation techniques, and we continue to do that. And, you know, I think that's really important. As we're recording this program, the track team is running by the building right now. There you go. So the kids can't wait to get outside without the mask. Right. Way. Talking about the mask, Troy Billy will be with us later on in the program. Troy, as we'd like to say, is the COVID guru in the Mayapak School District. He'll be explaining some of the ins and outs dealing with COVID and how it affects the parents, the kids, in the Mayapak School District. Before that, though, good weather. The turf field looks wonderful. Yeah, so they're actually, as we're speaking, spreading the sand and the rubber, which is the final stages. And then what happens, Eric, is we actually um, have a group of individuals who come out and certify the field mm -hmm. to make sure it's safe and operational. And we are hoping by the end of next week we'll be able to get on it. How uh, is the remainder of the project coming along? So, you know, uh, I have to say to the, to the Palumbo group, our construction managers, they have done a great job. Things are moving along. Um, we've gotten our STEM lab is up and running. Um, you know, the front entranceway was done. We're still waiting on some equipment for the uh, cafeteria. That's, again, some of these things we have no control over, Eric, because of the supply chain and what's happening. So they're, once they get in, we'll be able to finish some of the areas. The science rooms are coming back online. Sinks are being hooked up. Gas is being hooked up. So that will probably be completely finished by the end of next week. Mm -hmm. Uh, the two other areas we're waiting on, although that's coming closer and closer, is the choral room and the band room. Mm -hmm. um, so we're being cautiously optimistic, once again, that they're going to be able to be occupied yeah. probably the end of this month. Um, again, some of the furniture and some of the lighting is delayed, and they can work on that second shift, but we'll be able to get some of these things back. So it's progressing very well. Um, the kids are excited about it. Um, we have actually... Next week, the band students will be able to finally, if you remember, before we went back, those small little cubbies, right. they're now going to go into this huge, long hallway and have these beautiful areas to put their, you know, music, uh, you know, musical instruments in, and they're excited about that. So it's, it's really starting to come together. I think the, the kids are seeing it, the faculty is seeing it and enjoying it. Um, and again, I, I want to thank the community for the support of the project. Community. It wasn't for the community this wouldn't have happened. Exactly. And and we owe it to our students to put them in the best, you know, situations to be learning and for places for our teachers to be in and, and that's what this is all about. So again, I thank the community for their support along the way. Before we introduce Troy to you, busing, transportation. We did a whole show, if you remember, a year ago when this COVID outbreak first focused what children will do on the buses, what they shouldn't do on the buses, windows open, things like that. These bus drivers are unbelievable. There's a shortage of bus drivers around the country. Yeah. Is it a problem in the Yeah, it is. It's a problem across the country. And, and, and what I explained at our last school board meeting, I think it's really important for everybody to know. Um, we continue to recruit. We're trying to get drivers to come in. It's a national problem. And with that being said, um, we want to make sure we can do the best that we can each and every day. Mm -hmm. But there may be some days because of shortages and we have to double up buses and routes, that buses are going to run late. You know, um, we, when we have the majority of people in, because remember now, Eric, you have people that get sick. Yep. You get people that are going to get COVID. You have people that sometimes have to go out on FMLA. Just one of them has a domino effect. Now it's a handful. So I've mentioned to the public, and Eric, this could happen during the year where we may have to flip 
to a delayed opening or early dismissal because I have to double up buses and I don't have enough buses to pick people up. I don't want to see that happen, yeah. but that's the point of where we're at. Um, I reflect on this, right? Um, I'm going to have a big birthday coming up in a month. And I can remember 55 years ago, so you can kind of do the math of how old I am. <laughs> and I say to the public, really, nothing's changed, Eric. And you go back 55 years ago, my bus drivers were retired police officers and firefighters, right. and in, in some cases, tradespeople, mm -hmm. that and nothing's changed. So you add the pandemic, people have decided not to work as bus drivers because of the you know, intermingling with kids and the like, and they have their own health conditions or their family, yeah. and then nobody wants to come in. So it's the perfect storm. So we are trying, the other issue is this, and we're asking for some relief from the state. It takes about 12 weeks to get somebody on to be a bus driver. Mm. Because it's, it's about CDL, if they don't have a CDL, they've got to go through a 30 hour course, which they have to pay for. They then have to take the, the, the test and whatever. And so it's not just like, well, come in, you know, take a test, and then two weeks later you're driving the bus. It doesn't happen that way. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be here for the year. I mean, I think the state and federal government are trying to work out some incentives and get people involved in bu driving buses. But it, it's here for the short term to stay, and we're going to try to make the best of it. Okay. Another impact of COVID. Yeah, I mean, it, it, exactly. And But here's what I'm hoping. I want to leave on a, a, hopeful, a hopeful note. Mm -hmm. And our epidemiologist, Allison, from the county mentioned this. Once the vaccine is available for 5 to 12-year-olds, there's been a lot of conversation that hopefully this will now become an endemic kind of like the flu, that you have a shot available, that it's out there, and that hopefully we are, can get back, if you know what that, that is. And, and, and as you're seeing, the numbers nationally are starting to go down. Mm -hmm. But again, here's what I implore the public. What happened last year? Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Christmas. Yeah. So when you're together, right? So one thing, if everybody's vaccinated, that's a whole different discussion, and that's one discussion, whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. And you heard what Troy may be saying, that it'll, it's a different impact on contact tracing if you're vaccinated. But if you're going to be at these events, even if you're vaccinated, we're seeing so much of the outbreak on vaccinated people, you should be masked up if you're indoors. Okay? Um, again, vaccinated, that's a different story. But if you're not sure where you're at and who you're at, we want to try to maintain where we don't have to have schools shut and large swaths of classrooms because we come back after a activity like Halloween or Thanksgiving, whatever, and now we're back to last year's conditions. We really don't want to see that. So where we can be cautious, we definitely should be because we want to keep our kids. We want kids to be in school every single day. That's the goal for this year, and doing the things that they're doing: activities, sports, events, having PTOs do the Harvard Fest, and other things coming up. We want to continue that momentum. More on COVID right now on Spotlight on Bay of Hack Schools. Anthony, Troy Billy was with us today. Troy, of course, is the gentleman when it comes to COVID in the Bay of Hack Schools. He's the guy people turn to. Yeah, I mean, and the, the job that Troy has done since this pandemic and being the COVID coordinator and really working very hard with the building principals Transportation Department, uh, Putnam County Department of Health, state contractors. His job is has become so widespread, and and the work that he does, not only during the school day, but after school hours and on the weekend, is incredible. And 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 you hear me tell me to to the public all the time, we have become hospitalists. I mean, literally, doing and tracking and monitoring and, and entering all this information. And and Troy is the man behind the scene. He's done an incredible job. Uh, but things have changed mm. from last year's COVID and what's going on with quarantine to this year. And we wanted Troy to spend some time just giving the public a real better understanding of what his role is and what he does and then how he does it. Welcome. Thank you, sir. If you folks remember, Troy was with us about oh, a year or so ago. We had people from the health department with us here at that time. Since that time, Troy, how have things changed when it comes to public education and COVID? Yeah, so it's, it's been a bit of a roller coaster because, you know, we saw that there was a spike last year that then went down and then with the new Delta variant, 
We seem to have seen more uh, cases here in our school district. Uh, the good news is that uh, we're seeing that the amount of quarantine is less, uh, less in correlation with the positive cases. But um, if I can, I just wanted to take a moment just to kind of go over a few things that I've gotten many questions from the community uh, about, and hopefully it'll bring some clarification. Uh, one of the biggest questions I get is, uh, how do you calculate the number of days that a student is on quarantine? And so what we do is we follow the guidelines from set forth by the Putnam County Department of Health, and it is as such. Uh, we take the date of exposure, and we take the following day, the next day, and that's day one of quarantine. So if I'm exposed on October 4th, October 5th is day one of quarantine. Uh, the student is then placed on quarantine for 10 days. The district sets up uh, homebound tutors so that the student is provided uh, instructional support during that time. And then when their quarantine ends on the 10th day, and that's the letter that they get from the contact tracers that says it'll end on this day, that's the end of their quarantine. But with the school districts here in Putnam County, they don't come in until the 11th day. And so that's a little confusing piece mm -hmm. because some of our parents feel like the quarantine ended on this day, my child can come to school on that day. It's actually not until the following day. So the 11th day is when students can come back as long as they are asymptomatic, which means they have no symptoms. Um, so that's a big piece I wanted to clarify because there's many questions on that. Another question in relation to that is a lot of parents are seeing that in uh, the CDC says that you can test out of quarantine after a certain number of days. Unfortunately, New York State uh, does not uh, recognize that, nor does Putnam County recognize that. So I tell the parents that you have to see the quarantine through uh, and that they can come back on the 11th day. Another question that I get a lot of times is uh, how do you actually do the contact tracing investigation? And I've got a great team of administrators, our building nurses are involved, uh, our transportation department is involved, and they really take a deep dive to kind of see how uh, close the students are to the positive individual. And it's important to note that when it comes to student to student, and we're indoors and masks are on, windows are open, doors are open, uh, we're looking at a three foot radius, a center of head to center head of other students for more than 15 minutes. If they are caught up in a three foot radius for more than 15 minutes, masks are on and all that, then they have to quarantine. The only exception to this is if a person is fully vaccinated, which means that they have received their second shots uh, uh, two weeks after their second shot, or if they were COVID positive within the past 90 days. That is the only two pieces that will allow a student or a, or a staff member to be lifted from quarantine. It gets a little bit more complicated when we go to say a cafeteria uh, or a coral room where the masks are off. The three foot rule does not apply there. It actually is extended to six feet. So again, it's in a six foot radius of the COVID positive individual. If it's more than 15 minutes, that person has to quarantine unless they're fully vaccinated or had COVID within the past 90 days. Uh, these rules apply indoors. The game changes when you go outdoors. Uh, outdoors, you know, you, we don't have the masks and there's, many, there's much more flexibility. The last piece is with staff to student. When it comes staff to student, it's always six feet. So whenever we have a interaction that a staff member with a student who is COVID positive and it's within six feet for more than 15 minutes, then that staff member or that student would have to quarantine. The three foot rule does not apply. And again, if they're fully vaccinated or COVID positive the past 90 days, they do not have to uh, see the quarantine through. So those are the big pieces that I felt like I wanted to clarify for our community today. Um, and I'm always available if you need to reach out to me, billut at mayapac.org, or you can call me here at the fall school. My extension is 13504. You know, Anthony, I think people realize, maybe for the first time, why a school district needs a COVID coordinator. Uh, as you can see, the, the, the volume and the magnitude of the work that needs to be done, and to what Troy said before, and it's really important to understand, because we work so hard, we're quarantining less students than we would have last year because of some of these conditions changing. To Troy's point, 
And there are constantly conversations with the counties, with the state, and looking at data. So things could change. You know, it may be in a week or two, the state of New York decides to allow people to test out. Once that happens, myself and a team will notify the public, and we'll let you know. So it's still fluid, like it's been since the beginning of the year. Now, to Troy's point, we're seeing a lot of similarities to last year, mm -hmm. okay, in the following. We at Mayapac had the, the biggest amount of, really, start of school cases, right? People away, visiting, family, coming back. Now that we've gotten into our own routines and we'll work with certain people all the time, we're starting to see a little bit, I'm sure Troy is, not to the magnitude that we did. However, part of it also is that we have the lowest amount of our population of Manhattan vaccinated mm -hmm. in all of Putnam County. Okay, so, you know, there's a correlation with that, whether we like it or not. That's just the reality of the matter. I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong, but, you know, some of these factors attribute to it. Now, if we see a cluster, Troy, do you want to explain a little bit why sometimes we have to close down a classroom? Yes. That it has happened, and why it has and may in the future talk a little bit about a cluster and how the county identifies that and why we do that? Yeah, so uh, what happens is at times we'll see multiple positives within a certain location. We have seen that on a sports team this uh, earlier this year and also in some classrooms uh, in two of our elementary buildings. And uh, it's not the school district that determines that it's a cluster, it's actually the Putnam County Department of Health. And that what they will do is they will guide us and say that due to the total number of positives within that certain area, it is our true recommendation that you place the class on remote for 14 days. And the idea behind that is to mitigate and lessen the spread of it within the school. And we have seen that in these cases that where we have put these uh, classes on remote for 14 days, uh, we have seen a couple more of the students become positive. So making sure that they're not in our, in our schools helps reduce the spread. Right, and that's a great point, Charles, because I have to make a determination once we get the recommendation. As Quick Troy said, we're going to always err on the, the, the right. area of safety for all because if we don't, now you have a massive outbreak and you'll be closing the whole school down. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to do that. So, uh, you know, we do work hard and, and we take all these decisions, you know, very, very, very carefully. How many times a week are you in contact with the health department? Let's say it's a couple times daily. A couple times a day. Yes, and, wow. and it's, uh, you know, the Department of Health is incredible. Our administrators are incredible. Uh, this has become a 24-7 job for all of us. And, uh, you know, we're on the phone at night with administrators, with parents, uh, with Putnam County Department of Health, uh, really good people to work with, and uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be part of that team. And one, one bit of advice out there, it's the law, but still, as the superintendent mentioned in his weekly report last Friday, the fact that a lot of students, even at the high school, the masks are coming down a little too low. And the advice was you've got to keep those masks on inside the school buildings while when the weather's nice, educators are trying to take the kids outside mm -hmm. to get some fresh air and then take the masks off. It's definitely a challenge. You know, uh, being part of the high school for many years, I could see navigating classes period to period that sometimes that mask may fall below the nose, maybe not intentionally, but uh, yeah, keeping that mask, covering your nose and covering your mouth is the safest way to move forward. And you want to second that motion? Yeah, and we've seen studies the last couple of weeks that are saying that. Yeah. Three and a half times more effective by having the mask. So we want to keep our kids in school. We want them to be in every day. We want them to learn. The teachers want them to be in every day. And so in order to do that, we have to be effective. And, and I will tell you, when students are not following those rules, you know, the, the administrators are speaking with them and letting them know, because it's not fair now for you to jeopardize my health or somebody else's health because you're not wearing a mask properly and, and making sure that it's on. So we work with it. It's important to understand that this will keep us safe. And mom and dad, talk to your, your children about this as well. Keep those masks on in school. And another bit of advice is if your child feels a little not so good, as they say, keep them home that day. Yeah, and I, just so that we understand this, we have, have mask breaks. Yeah. This is not where the kids have it on from the time they walk in until the time the day's right. over. At lunch, they get the break. You know, they're outside running around. If they're in gym class, 
If you're my teacher, you'll bring me outside. But we do offer mass breaks. I don't want to fit, tell people that, you know, the, the masks are on and that there's no fresh air being done or coming in. That, that is not true. That The teachers make sure that during the day, mass breaks are given. Okay. Well, Troy, we thank you so much for joining us. That number again to call 628-3415 and the extension? It is 13504. 13504. Troy Billiam, thank you, sir. Anthony and I will be right back. That Troy Billiam knows a lot about COVID. Yeah, he really does. He works really closely. Like I said, they have COVID coordinated calls every Friday with the other coordinators in Putnam, Northern Westchester, Bosey, along with the you know Department of Health. And it's onerous. There's a lot of hours that go into it. And that's what I've said you know, in my last board meeting, the amount of work that is going into this above and beyond mm -hmm. education. You know, Eric, I, we, I'd love to just start to get, have conversations back about education. And, and, and I don't mean to be flippant. We have become hospitalists over the last 18 months. And now you have to add on testing to that, which is a whole nother mm -hmm. discussion down the road. National School Board Recognition Week coming up later this month as we said the other night at that uh, gathering, the heroes night, they're heroes too, these ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, and it's tough. Being a school board member, if you're watching what's happening around the country, yeah. it's not, you know, it's not an easy job because, again, just like we talk about this all the time, yeah. we have to follow certain state restrictions and mandates, and it, it, it's really, really not easy. And, you know, they, they volunteer their services, you know, they're out a number of nights, and more so probably now than ever with COVID, meeting after meeting after meeting. So to our board members, the nine of them, I just, you know, thank them for what they do each and every day and how they continue their service, which is a, a, a tribute to them wanting to have the best school district that we can possibly have. And we'll be recognizing them in the next couple of weeks at our, at our October board meeting. And if you see a board member, say thank you for a job well done. We appreciate it. Yeah, very much okay. so. Superintendent of Schools, Anthony DiCarlo, I'm Eric Gross. We thank you so much for joining us for this edition of Spotlight on Mayor Pack Schools. Nastasha Pismilski, be well, stay safe. We'll be back with another edition right here. Have a good day. Bye-bye now. For more information, please visit our website, www.mayopac.org. More videos can also be found on our YouTube news channel mcsd.news.